As expected, we are now getting word from a U.S. defense official that the retaliation has begun, that U.S. airstrikes from multiple platforms have begun in the retaliation for the deaths of three U.S. service members who, uh, whose bodies were transferred to Dover, Delaware today. Jennifer Griffin is reporting that the strikes are at targets in Syria, and Jennifer is uh, joining us right now from uh, the Pentagon. Jennifer, good to have you with us. Uh, obviously, we've been waiting for word that this is underway. Tell us, tell us what you're learning. Well, Martha, what I'm hearing from senior U.S. defense officials is that strikes from multiple U.S. Flat platforms have begun against targets in Syria. They may not be limited to those targets in Syria, but the first explosions have been heard on the ground, and we can now confirm from a U.S. defense official that the U.S. is involved in those uh, targeted airstrikes. Uh, they would not tell me exactly which platforms were firing, but we do know that B-1B uh, Lancer bombers have been uh, deployed to the region. Those are, of course, the Air Force's largest. It's a supersonic uh, uh, warplane that can drop the largest conventional payload. Uh, you also have multiple uh, U.S. destroyers in the region that can fire tomahawks. You have the USS Florida, which is a, uh, a submarine that also is, is loaded with about 150 Tomahawk missiles. Uh, we've been expecting this. This has been the sort of the worst kept secret in Washington. The, the president said earlier this week that he had taken a decision. We knew that U.S. Central Command had put together a series of targets, a campaign, if you will. We heard from Defense Secretary Austin yesterday here in the Pentagon briefing room that this would be a multi-tiered and multi-day, if not multi-week, um, uh, campaign against these Iranian proxies that have been threatening U.S. forces, firing up to 166 times in the last few months at U.S. bases, killing three Americans. Those three uh, brave Americans were, uh, were returned home in a dignified transfer uh, just moments ago. The president, the defense secretary, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the head of the Army were all there uh, to greet those um, three American soldiers who died when the Iranian-backed uh, proxy fired that drone on Sunday while they were sleeping in their barracks. So that ceremony is over at Dover, and now uh, we're told this is the beginning of a what we're told is a long campaign over the coming days uh, to target those Iranian-backed proxies. The problem is, Martha, as we've also been reporting, there's been so much telegraphing that most of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps um, have been pulled out of those bases, have returned to Tehran, to Iran, and many of those proxy groups have gone into hiding. Martha. Well, that's not surprising, uh, given the fact that it's also been made pretty clear that the targets would not be inside of Iran. They would be in Syria and likely in Iraq. And as you're reporting, it, uh, it, the early stage here appears to be aimed at Syria. I guess the, one of the questions, Jennifer, is we have seen these more than 166 attacks on U.S. interests, U.S. bases in these areas. And it, it felt inevitable that at some point there would be, sadly, a loss of life. Uh, on these U.S. bases, which we saw at Tower 22, which is in the um, sort of northeastern corner of, of Jordan and provides security services over the areas in Syria, refugee camps and the like. Um, what would be the likely targets in order to disable the ability to carry out these kinds of attacks? What can we learn about what they are likely heading? Well, remember, Martha, the 166 attacks, which been, what has been so extraordinary, and you did feel as though it was only a matter of time before one of these drones or rockets or ballistic missiles got through to the bases. But the air defense systems at these bases has been really extraordinary. They've shot down most of these drones. A lot of these um, missiles and rockets have, have missed their targets. The Iranian um, targeting system is not that great, frankly. Uh, but the, and the, the proxies, if, you know, they have missed their targets on numerous occasions, even though they have been trying, don't get me wrong, they've been trying to kill Americans and U.S. forces in each of these 166 attacks. Sunday's attack was a little different because it was a drone that basically there was confusion because an American drone was returning to this, this American outpost. And so it was a, a terrible coincidence and led to some confusion, and that uh, Iranian uh, proxy drone was able to come into the base. Um, in terms of targets, you can expect, and what we're hearing is in this first wave, uh, Syria and 
I'm told by well-placed sources that Iraq uh, bases in Iraq for these Iranian proxies will also be hit. Um, there, I would expect storage facilities, places where these uh, drones and ballistic missiles had been uh, stored and kept, uh, would be targeted. I would expect the leaders of some of these groups to be targeted. You've seen uh, the U.S. has been one of the reasons that it took a few days, I think, to get everything into position, is that there's always intelligence being gathered about the movement of the leaders of these proxy groups. Uh, the U.S. has very significant eyes on, uh, from the sky, on, on these various uh, proxy groups and their leaders. But the problem is they can blend in, as we've seen elsewhere in the Middle East. You can blend into the civilian population easily. You can hide inside mosques. You can hide inside hospitals. And so uh, a lot of these groups have gone to ground at this point, and it's not quite that easy uh, to target them when it's been messaged so for so many days uh, that the U.S. would respond. But I would expect many of these bases that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps have been using. You also have seen, and it's quite interesting, that a number of IRGC Iranian commanders in uh, Syria itself, down in closer to Damascus, have been targeted and killed in, in recent days. Those were Israeli airstrikes separate from this. But the Iranians have been getting a clear message and pulled a lot of those IRGC commanders out for fear that this, uh, this campaign over the next few days and weeks would target them. So I would expect a, a probably more than a dozen, uh, possibly, uh, you know, up to two tar dozen targets. I would expect that the, the strikes, the U.S. strikes, would be in Syria and, and Iraq. I do not believe that there will be targeting down in to Yemen at this time, despite all of these, uh, these incredible numbers of, of missiles uh, being fired by the Houthis from Yemen into the shipping lanes in, in the Red Sea and targeting U.S. warships. I think that the U.S. military and the White House want to keep these different theaters separate. And this, yeah. right now, is a targeted campaign, a response to the killing of those three Americans, the wounding of 41 Americans. And I think the targets will all be in Syria and Iraq. Uh, the, the point that you just made, I want to ask you about, Jennifer, because there's been sort of a two-pronged narrative in terms of framing how people should look at all of this. And one of the things that we, we think came likely out of the State Department was this message that Iran doesn't really know what the proxies are doing, that they do not have strings attached to all of them, and that sometimes they go off and do their own thing with weapons that they might have acquired from, uh, from Iran, which, which seeks to give a little space between these proxies and Iran, which, you know, I think there, there's some dispute over whether or not that's really merited to look at it that way. The other thing is that there's been an effort on the part of the defense secretary and the president to say that these things aren't connected to what happened on October 7th. They say, well, Gaza is Gaza. That's a whole separate thing. What we're working on now are these hot spots that are happening in Iran and Syria. And yet this group calls itself the Islamic resistance as, as sort of an umbrella over all of these efforts. So... Your thoughts on, on how they're trying to frame this and whether or not it's accurate? Well, they're tying themselves in pretzels because mm -hmm. the common theme to all of these attacks, whether it is Hamas attacking Israel, whether it's Hezbollah in Lebanon, whether it's the Houthis or the uh, whatever group, they, whatever they want to call themselves now in Iraq and Syria, they all have one thing in common. They are Iranian proxies. They would not exist without the money and the weapons that are provided by Iran. But it is also accurate to say, and I've been covering the Houthis for, for many years now, uh, the Iranians do not have perfect command and control over the Houthis. The Houthis are a bit unruly, and they can't just be called by the IRGC and said, stop now. It's, it's not a light switch that you turn on and off. They've created these uh, proxies. They've armed them to the teeth. Uh, now, could Iran stop funding them? Could they stop providing weapons? Yes, they could, and they haven't. And that is where Iran is culpable. And But it is extremely clear from listening to U.S. leaders uh, that they do not want to have an all-out war with Iran. They are hoping that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, with the targeting that's going to be taking place and the loss of, of bases and storage facilities in the coming uh, days and weeks, that Iran gets the message to cool it in Syria and Iraq, because U.S. forces are not pulling out. They're there as part of an anti-ISIS coalition. They're not there to fight with Israel against Hamas. They're not there to fight the Houthis. They are 
it, it may sound confusing to our audience, but these are three different, um, they're all interconnected because of the Iranian thread, but they are three different theaters. And the reason the U.S. wants to keep them separate, even though it gets overlapped and confusing at times, is, is that, you know, they really are trying to avoid an all-out regional war in the Middle East. And we're very close to one breaking out. You heard that from Secretary of State Blinken. You heard from the president of Iran today with his veiled threats that if Iran is bullied, that they will respond. So the question is, how do you send a message, reestablish deterrence, and not have an all-out war? And that is really what they're navigating today. And we'll see what happens with these airstrikes and whether it has an effect. Um, there are many who have argued that it's too little too late and that, the, that it's going to take a lot more than a few days or weeks of airstrikes to reestablish deterrence. Martha. So you said that uh, you do not expect to see anything in Yemen. In a piece this week in The Wall Street Journal, an editorial piece, they called for the sinking of an Iranian spy ship in the Red Sea to send a very strong message. And as you just point out, we have to sort of carry these strikes out and then wait to see if the message is strong enough, if it's effective. The whole point of all of this is to push them back on their heels and get them to, to stop, right? I think that is the goal. And when you look at a, a multi-tiered campaign like CENTCOM has put forward and is starting to be executed, as we see in the coming hours and days, uh, there's going to be an escalation to this. So this first night, uh, they're sending a signal. They're going to take out certain assets, and and uh, and then you'll see how does Iran respond? How do the Iranian proxies respond? How do the Houthis respond? If the Houthis are quiet, then there may be some room uh, for a, a shift in in targeting. If the Houthis decide to to go all in and and target U.S. warships, well, then all bets are off, and then the sites in Yemen will be targeted. So all of this is based on the reaction from the enemy. Uh, Iran has a vote. Iranian proxies have a vote. The U.S. military is trying to send a very clear message, but they certainly have enough firepower in the region. Uh, if you look at all the Navy vessels, all of the destroyers, the submarines, the, um, uh, the aircraft carrier, the Eisenhower that are there, and then you now have B-1B bombers coming in uh, to, you know, into that airspace. These are very, very lethal. You have the entire Air Force um, at the ready. You have the USS Bataan, which has F-35s and, and uh, Harriers that are ver capable of vertical takeoff. Uh, you've got a lot of firepower. And so they're going to send a message tonight. They're going to see how the enemy responds. And it's going to be a campaign, we're told. And if the Iranians don't respond well, and if the Iranian proxies don't respond well, I'm told it will escalate. But you don't come out of, off the bat and sink, uh, you know, uh, arguably, you have choices here. And the, the, I believe that what you're more likely to see, uh, based on my studying this over time and having discussions with people, is you're going to see a first, a first play. And then if it escalates, the U.S. is prepared to, to go further. Jennifer, thank you very much. Uh, we'll give you some time to see what you can learn about the specific specificity of these strikes, where these hits are, what they look like, what kind of assets we're using in the initial stages of this retaliatory attack uh, against Syria and uh, sites in Syria and Iraq that are um, Iran proxy uh, bases um, for all of the action that we have been seeing recently. Jennifer, thank you very much. Let us hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.